It's great to see you, Harvey. Good uh, to see you too. Thank you for doing this. Listen, Harvey, we um, we as an organization have, as as you and I have talked, have, have been on a on a on a journey, uh, on a long term journey to do our part to really make this world the place that we would like it to be. Right? And, and, uh, and this is a really serious commitment that's gonna take time. So the goal of today really is to uh, get to know you, and, but to use your wisdom um, and your experience to educate us further on a number of issues. I wanna go back um, in, you know, it, it is amazing to read that you're the first black student at Clemson, but I'm sure it didn't feel amazing as you decided to apply or as you showed up and you, you know, were so different than everybody else there. Um, first of all, what, what made you want to break through that wall? And two, what was it really like being that um, unique uh, in a setting like that? And, and how did you deal with that? Well, it's a little bit of a long story. And I, I, I have to start off with the fact that uh, I was I was born in a different era than we we see today. Uh, I was born in the segregated South in Charleston, South Carolina. Grew up in a segregated environment. Uh, in my childhood up until I was about ten or eleven years old, uh, we did things as a matter of custom. That is, uh, mm-hmm. we sat at the back of the bus. We drank from the colored water fountain. We went to segregated schools. And, um, you know, I was, it was not an unhappy childhood for me. I, I just accepted uh, what, what were the norms of that time. Um, but we had these dinner table discussions all through my childhood. And particularly what I started to remember at around eight or nine years old was my father talking about the unfairness of segregation and that, that this was not wrong. It, and, and he had these great ambitions for his children that we'd all get a college education and we'd all do far better than he and my mother. Uh, and uh, he introduced us to the idea of being a part of something in the community that would make life better. And he pointed out why we were walking past the white elementary school to go to the black elementary school or that the textbooks were not quite um, what they would have in the white schools. And he said, this is morally wrong. And uh, he, he preached that to us and reinforced by my mother, we knew then that segregation was wrong. And, and in 1954, when I was 11 years old, the Supreme Court said segregation truly is unconstitutional. Um, and that made all the difference in the world to my family and to me, uh, because my father thought that the promise of America was really gonna be made real then, because his children were gonna be able to live in a society where they were gonna be judged, to use Martin Luther King's words, on, the, um, on merit as opposed to the color of their skin. And um, so I started to act on that as a kid at 11 years old, starting to look around me and becoming aware of things and joining organizations that talked about freedom and, uh, and uh, getting rid of segregation. Uh, the Supreme Court acted in 54, but it took a while, Rick, for mm-hmm. that to become a reality in the lives of most African Americans and white Americans. Um, it just took a while. I sat in at lunch counters during the senior years of my high, I mean, the years of my high school, uh, uh, days and uh, and then took the advice of a guidance counselor and went to Iowa State University to study architecture because there were only two percent of the architects in the country were black and she felt that I needed to study it at an institution where most white people were. And that's a long way around to say. I went to Iowa State, didn't like the cold weather, loved the people in Iowa but wanted to come home to where I was born and raised. And so I saw some information that said Clemson was one of the better schools in the country, believe it or not. Mm. And I went on to uh, apply to go to school at Clemson, knowing that that was not the norm. Um, But I said, I'll bet you 
if I apply to Clemson and I've got good grades, I'm going to be accepted uh, as a student. Uh, that did not turn out to be true. I applied five times, finally took it to court. Uh, and uh, we won uh, the Court of Appeals, Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals allowed me to become a student or said I had a right to become a student. And of course, I followed through on that in January of 1963. Uh, I went to school at Clemson. Uh, I knew I'd be, it was going to be a little bit different experience than being a kid who was normally just going to school and matriculating with other architects, but I thought I would do it. And it turned out to be a great experience. I had some people who were negative, did not want me to be there, felt I should be ostracized uh, so that I'd become so discouraged I wouldn't stay. Uh, but I had a lot of students who, uh, a good enough range of students in the architecture school and in uh, one of the churches in the community that befriended me and made life reasonable. And that's really all I needed was the opportunity to prove that I, I should have the right to this education and that I could succeed in, in this environment also. Uh, it turned out to be those almost three years at Clemson turned out to be the best thing that ever happened to me. In addition to meeting my wife, which you all noted in the beginning, who was uh, my, my, my partner in crime for the last 56 years. Uh, I got a great degree, got hired by Charlotte firm, chose, chose Charlotte over Atlanta, huh. and I've come here and uh, never really left except for a, a short stint in graduate school. That's a long way to answer that question. But I love it. Hey, I get, to, listen, I, 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 I think everybody, um, you know, it, it, so Harvey, it, it, it just to, um, it made me think a little bit of, you know, in many ways, I, for those of us who have not been around from that time period, it feels like we're making so little progress, but listening to the dreams of your dad um, and, you know, probably your grandkids today, um, are, do you feel like we've made meaningful progress and are you optimistic that the progress will continue in, in light especially of kind of the awakening of this country uh, around kind of the embedded racism that still exists across our society? Well, let me put this in context too. I, I think that graduating from Clemson meeting my wife, coming to Charlotte, uh, getting a graduate degree from a top-notch institution, uh, being the father of four children, grandfather to nine grandchildren. Uh, you might say that I feel as if I've been successful. We've had a successful architectural firm for over 40 some odd years here in Charlotte. We've designed some buildings that are memorable. People will like all those kinds of things. So I can say personally that I've seen success. I have seen a lot of my peers and friends do very well in this society. But I would be naive to say that what we are seeing today in the arena of social justice, uh, systemic racism, uh, I, would, I would be wrong to say, look, we solved it all back in the 60s with the civil rights movement. We didn't. What we did effectively was to eliminate the laws that supported a morally bankrupt system of segregation. Uh, we did change laws. We did some things. We elected some political leaders of di different persuasions, and, and they made those changes. But what they did not do was eliminate systemic racism, which is the cancer of this country that will eat us alive one day if we don't address it. Uh, put another way, I was able to sit in a classroom at Clemson or start an architectural firm and do well with people that like me and like my design. But what I was not able to do and what we have not as a society been able to do is to eliminate the stain 
of racism, which rears its ugly head in so many ways. And we're seeing that now, even in this period where we, we're in a pandemic. Uh, marginal neighborhoods, people with chronic illnesses, a lot of it due to their state in society. People who can't move up the economic ladder. Uh, this whole notion of if you're born black, there are two or three strikes against you unless you make unusual efforts to try to overcome. And even when you're overcoming it, you can still be stopped on a highway uh, by law enforcement because you're drive, driving the wrong car or your headlights not quite working right. And the only reason for that stop is because of the color of your skin. So we know that we've got a lot to address and the problems are even more substantial, and thought I'd never say this, than actually trying to, to uh, exhaust all the exam administrative remedies of getting into Clemson or going to court to have the courts interpret the law of the land. How do you change a man's heart? How do you deal with this thing of, quote, white privilege? How do you, how do you overcome the inability of African-Americans to gain wealth in our society because of racist systems that didn't allow that to occur in the way it should. How do you deal with the fact that the marginal uh, online frontline workers are predominantly African-American largely because they've been denied true opportunity to succeed. So there are just so many issues that you and I, and more importantly, younger people and people in your company are going to have to address that cannot be solved by laws or by changing laws. That's where I am. We made progress, but the bigger issues are still out there to tackle. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to compose myself a little bit. Um, the, um, so, so Harvey, what, what's it gonna take for our country to accelerate the change that is needed and what can you know we starting as individuals but maybe collectively as a team in a company like red ventures what what, what are things that are could be impactful meaningful purposeful because it's going to take everybody oh it absolutely is going to take everybody Rick. and i'm pleased to see your interest in this uh and you and I met in some unusual circumstances, but I've, I've enjoyed our friendship and I enjoy the sincerity that you've shown to me that you're really interested in knowing and understanding what it is that you, your company, society in general can do about where we are. I think that we are much too divided today as a nation. Uh, even back then when I was mayor of Charlotte, I, I had wonderful times dealing with my Republican colleagues on city council. And we could talk and disagree about some things, but at least the key was we could talk through those issues. Mm -hmm. Today, I think we're so divided, we're so easily labeled that we can't have a fruitful discussion unless all the people are pulling in the same direction. And there's something wrong with a, a democratic society where I can't have a reasonable conversation unless I'm talking to somebody who is absolutely of my political uh, position, uh, someone who is supporting all the things I'm saying. Now, there are lots of reasons for why that situation has occurred, but I think we've got to start to talk honestly with each other. That's a simplistic way of looking at it. But when I meet my neighbor, I need to be more honest about what's going on out there and to share my feelings and to share my fears. Now, what will help us to get to that kind of society is for our leadership to recognize that the country is slipping in lots of ways. When we can't pull together as a nation, we are going to be in trouble. Um, and I mean, Republicans have to talk to Democrats. And one of the prime examples is watching our Congress right now having some difficulty 
getting together because we are seeing so much political posturing between the two parties that nothing is getting done and people are getting angrier and angrier. So you ask me, what, what's the solution? Human beings have to start to recognize that we're all in this together, mm. whether you like it or not, or whether you think there's a, another way to go. We're not going, we, we're not going to make it with, with all these factions that are pulling against each other that I'm hearing now people are talking about civil war and all that kind of stuff again. We can't, we can't go that direction. So the leadership of this country has got to recognize that we need to pull together. And then we need to have some honest conversations with each other. Hmm. Uh, my, my conservative friend has some fears, things that cause him to maybe support certain candidates or take certain positions or have certain fears. Uh, but I need to hear that. But he also needs to hear me honestly saying what my concerns are. He needs to hear me talk about the fact that the nation has never apologized for slavery and not turn me off before I could start to talk about what that has meant to my great great grandfather, to my great grandfather, to right on through to this present time. Uh, he needs to understand why I worry about when my grandchildren are in elementary school, they seem to be getting along fine. And then they, as they grow older, something happens. They, they, the, the white kids drift away from them. And uh, so there's some message being sent. Uh, whether it's a dog whistle or what, that says you're different from me and therefore I can't be with you. Those kinds of, those kinds of things suggest that we're not honestly talking to each other. And you know I've said uh, many times we need to find some safe places where people can really talk to each other without fingers being pointed and uh, political parties getting in the way of uh, an honest and maybe even uncomfortable conversation with our neighbor. Thank you. Um, Harvey, I, I think the elections, the, our vote, are electing people that can be the kind of leaders that can lead us to this type of conversations. Maybe the most paramount thing we can do as citizens. Give us a little bit of a civics class here, you know, because everybody focuses on the precedent. Um, but you know, from, from your experience, having been in government and, and even running for US Senate, um, what is the importance of this election in your mind? And, and what are the positions that really, really matter uh, in terms of making an impact on this? Well, first of all, I hope that people out there be, uh, are trying to get as informed as they possibly can. I hope in Red Ventures, you've got information about who's running for what and a little bit about what these candidates stand for. And I hope people will go past the, the D or the R behind each of these candidates running. And I'm talking about from president to senator to governor to congressman to council of state folks that are running and try to see if you can get as much information as you can on the candidates and then glean from what you are getting who are the people who are going to bring us together hmm. who are the people who are talking about advancing us who are the people who are talking about doing something for the marginal folks in our society the folks who are on the edge the folks who don't have access to health care or to a good education, who are those people? Get in, as informed as you possibly can. You know, I've chosen the people that I, that I think are, are, are going to, but I'm not going to share that with you at this point <laughs> because I want, I want, I want your, your, your associates to make the decision themselves 
based on what they see and what they see believe our society needs. One of the things that I think hurts us a little bit is all the information that's out there. Hmm. You, you t- turn on the television and we've got a 24 hour news cycle uh, in which if you tone into uh, two or three of these stations, uh, therefore this person or this philosophy, and it's totally in that direction. And another station may be totally the other way. So Fox News and MSNBC, you will get two philosophies of what this country ought to be about from the state and local all the way to the national level. Uh, you have to decide. You have to read. You have to think about what the most important things are that we need as a, as a nation. And quite frankly, I think this election, I used to think others were, but I, I, I think this is our most important election in the history of all the years I've been here. It is the most important election from city council, county commission, all the way up to the presidency. And I say that because whoever gets elected, if they're not showing an inclination, Rick, to bring this country together or an effort to say, I'm going to try to do that. I'm going to try to get beyond party labels, liberal, conservative philosophy, but to deal with things that people care about, housing, education, uh, uh, health care. Um, those are the kinds of things people care about. Paying people decent wages. You know, I, I tell the story of the struggling family that's working hard, but they're working two or three jobs to try to stay up with the three kids they've got. Something's wrong with that picture. You know, these are not these are not people who are looking for the government to solve their problems. They're hardworking, but they're working in America and they can't make a decent wage to, 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 to afford to live in the society. There is something wrong with that picture and businesses, governments, others have to recognize that we've got to do better than that. We've got to do better than that. So the, 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 the candidates who, who care about bringing us together about dealing with marginal situations in our society, about respecting the humanity of people, no matter what race, color, or creed they are. Those are the people Harvey Gantt supports. Uh, you know, and, and if they have an R label, that's fine. If they have a D label, that's fine. But at least I know something about who they are as people. Isn't that interesting, Harvey, that um in your rule book, which I agree with, it's not which party you are for is, do you believe in the greater good or do you believe in your own good? Because, you know, I think if you, if the, the Republicans today that may not be in agreement with the tone of our country that are struggling making the transition to vote for something else is because there's a personal reasons, so be taxes, so be other reasons that they don't make that trend, that that leap. While there are others who are saying, you know what, if we don't get in a better path, our kids and our grandkids are not going to have the country that we want for them, right? And I think that, that really becomes the, how long-term minded are you on your boat? I hope you're long-term minded, to use your term. Um, I think this is not a, a, always going to be a win-win situation. Let me try to explain that. I don't think, you know, you're, you're a corporation. I, I think you've got a responsibility to the people who are working at Red Ventures, the employees, the associates you have there. You have a responsibility to your stockholders you have a responsibility to your customers, but you have a bigger responsibility to society too. I really do think you have a bigger 
responsibility in that vein. I heard someone the other day say to me, well, I'm going to support candidate A because that candidate uh, has made things better for me economically. And I know that Canada does some things that people get angry about and so forth and so on, but I'm going to support them because they're going to make things better for me and my family. That's sad, Rick. That is really sad. This per person happened to be a very, very wealthy individual. And I sort of said to myself, walking away, so if, if the taxes that you pay are less and you're doing better because of this individual's policies, what's the difference between making $1 billion and making $980 billion? What, you know, in terms of how much better can you do? But if you have a society around you that ultimately may threaten your well-being and your family's well-being. How are you better off? You've got people who have much may have to give something back in order for society to become a better place. And I'm concerned about what happens to our society as a whole than I am about what might happen to Harvey Gantt personally. I think I can navigate, but I'm not sure that there are people out, all the folks out there who are living literally on the edge can navigate. And so they do get angry and they do march and they protest because they're holding on to a lifeline. They, you know, they've got to find a way to live, to feed their families, to, try to make the promise of America come real to their children. And a lot of people are not seeing that today. Mm. And that's the sad thing. You know, I watched the first debate with my 17 year old daughter uh, the other night. And it's the first time she's watched a debate. And I was tempted to turn it off so that she didn't think that that's what it meant to have a debate in politics. In three quarters through the debate, she goes, "This is a circus. What is this?" Right? And you know, it just it was it was a moment in time where I wasn't proud of either of them. I wasn't proud of us as a country. And you know, and you know, I have this deep sense that we're we're we're, we're falling fast. We're not. We're this is just like when 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 we get to that level in a presidential debate, uh, I think it's a it's a really bad sign. But I, I want to close out. Last question, Harvey. You know, you don't go to Clemson as the first black student and fight your way through the courts to do that without a sense of hope and optimism that you can make a difference and then things can be better. What message? We have two thousand people listening to you right now. What message would you give? And a lot of them are very young, with a lot of life ahead of them. What message would you give them? Uh, that will give them hope and optimism for the future? I think you need to believe in America. That's strange. I, I, I am an eternal optimist. I, I believe that the principles upon which this country were founded, for the most part, make sense. And, it's, and things can change. And we've been through some tough periods in our history. We have. But my, my own life is, 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 is an example of if you have hope and you're optimistic about the future and you're willing to go out there and try to make change, positive change happen, things do happen. Mm. Let me tell you what gives me more hope. Without preaching to my grandchildren about what they needed to do, when the protests started here in Charlotte, two of them showed up at my doorstep, even during the pandemic, masked and all, to say, Granddaddy, we just came back from a 
march in Charlotte because what we thought was going on uh, with regard to police brutality was wrong. Mm -hmm. And and we decided to go and we didn't ask you, mom, dad, or anybody else. We just thought we should go. And they went with lots of their classmates, many of whom are white. So this wasn't just a black thing, so to speak. And you know what? I was trying to think of what the difference between that and a lot of the demonstrations I did when we were trying to sit in at lunch counters way back in the late 50s and 60s. And the difference was when I looked across America, I saw lots of young people with black people, black and white, together. They saw something morally wrong about what was going on and they were banding together. So you ask me if I'm hopeful? Oh, yes, I am. Hmm. Because I think those kids are the America of tomorrow and we're gonna be better off for it. I think they're gonna deal with issues of race, climate change, the equitable distribution of resources as much as you can get it to keep marginal people becoming even more marginalized. I think they're gonna deal with those issues. My prayer is that they're gonna be successful. Uh, so I'm hopeful, Rick. I'm hopeful when I meet people like you uh, because of what I see you trying to do. Uh, 30 years ago, I'm not sure I would have seen a CEO in the position you're in today. So I'm optimistic that the promise of America is gonna be made real for you and me and our, and our children. Harvey, uh, thank you seems completely inadequate right now. Um, I am forever grateful. I think you have uh, really touched 2,000 of us. I, I wish the country could listen to this because it's a balanced, fair, honest assessment of where we are and where we can be. Thank you for being such a role model for all of us. Well, thank you for allowing me to be here.